Okay, thanks a lot, um, Carlos. Uh, firstly, thank you for having me um, um, uh, join in as one of the um, speakers. Uh, thank you, Bobby. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, great company. And of course, thank you for sharing. Um, well, you've heard the lectures on how to implant it. Um, sadly, eventually, as your age is, uh, patients will get older and there's a chance you're not yet retired. Um, some of these patients will uh, develop cataracts eventually. And uh, hopefully, well, probably if you don't do proper preoperative um, screening, you might need to explant uh, 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 an ICL and change it, but uh, hopefully uh, uh, the things you've learned uh, uh, with um, if Bobby and Lisa's talk will, will suffice that you won't. So let me just share my personal experience. This was uh, last year. Um, I was referred uh, by another colleague, an uh, eye doctor, a uh, 59-year-old ma male patient. Uh, he was actually having um, gradual blurring of vision on both eyes, uh, right more than the left. Um, he was an early adapter of the ICL implants. He actually went to the U.S. Uh, and had both eyes done um, almost 20 years ago. All right. And, um, well, we, we know he was highly myopic and he has astigmatism on both eyes. Okay. So I exam findings. Um, visual acuity wasn't that good. The right eye was... Um, best corrected to just about 2070, the left eye to 2050. All right, the anterior chamber findings, um, well, uh, I didn't really dilate the, the pupil uh, the first time I saw him, uh, but I did notice that uh, on the right eye, there was already a slightly decentered um, ICL, and then there was a presence of um, anterior subcapsular cataracts that were significant, and of course, a nuclear sclerosis already. Left eye was the same. Uh, again, uh, prominent anterior subcapsular cataracts. Uh, this ICL, if you can see in the photo, um, uh, you can see the edge of the ICL already. So it was significantly decentered. Uh, it did not have um, the aquaport. Of course, if it's decentered like this, um, you wouldn't really see it. Okay, I tried to take a, a slit lamp photo to just show um, the vaulting. Um, sorry, the image is a little blurred. There. Oh, sorry, let me backtrack. So there. Um, there was still some amount of fault, and you can see the cataract already. So going to... Oh, there, there it is. All right. Um, I did not um, have any imaging done like an OCT. This is um, uh, the left eye now. As you can see, uh, there's significant, you can actually notice the subcapsular cataracts already here, right there. Um, there were also um, iridotomies in both eyes, both at 11 o'clock and at one o'clock. Um, again, uh, my apologies. So I tried to take a slit lamp just to check the vault, but unfortunately the photo came out um, blurry. Okay, so, all right, so, um, oops, sorry. Um, so, uh, with regards to the ancillary exams, um, doesn't want to. Mm, sorry. Okay. My laptop's hand yeah, there. All right. Oh, sorry. So let me go back. You can still see the slide, right? Yes. So, we going, can. Back, so going back to the ancillary exam. So um, since we were going to remove the ICL and uh, the cataract along with it, so we had a, a swept source biometry measurement taken. So you can see for the right eye, a uh, very long axial length, 31.08 millimeters. The left eye was, has had an even longer eyeball, 33.25. Um, the anterior chamber depths were quite okay considering there's a, a fake um, implant inside. Uh, lens, lens thickness, 
um, were quite um, more on the longer side, probably because the the OCT was sampling the the sur anterior surface of the ICL along with the the whole of the lens. That's why it's around 5.13 on the right and then 4.73. And then through the keratometry measurements, we could appreciate there was quite a significant uh, 1.6 uh, to 1.8 diopters of uh, with the rule astigmatism. And then um, this was confirmed by um, the topography measurement, this one on the right, and then this one on the left side. Okay. Um, Siguro, this partly answers um, an open forum question a while ago. What is the effect on the endothelium? Uh, this patient, although not yet 60 years old, did have ICL implants and had these lens, uh, these implants has been there for almost 20 years. The cell count was, was pretty good. Okay. So the cell density was around 2,600 uh, on both eyes. So um, this is a good, unlike Probably if some of us um, were implanting the cache anterior chamber phacic lenses before, this is not a typical um, endothelial spec photo you would, you would actually notice, right? So, um, of course, the surgical plan was after we get clearances from the internist, from the anesthesiologist, and especially from his retina IMB, which uh, he had been following up regularly, uh, we discussed with the patient to do a sequential um, phacic IOL removal, cataract surgery, and then, of course, we'll put in a toric monofocal PC IOL so we can take care of the significant corneal astigmatism in, bo in both eyes. Uh, we decided to do this under local anesthesia with sedation because um, I was anticipating because of the long eyeball, there will be quite a significant um, intraop uh, uh, retropulsion of the eye and some patients actually found, find this very inconvenient or uh, to some extent painful. All right, so this is the computation we got from the parameters we got from the biometry. Uh, the patient would actually need a negative powered IOL, of course, with the two diopter of cylinder, um, much more so with the longer eyeball on the left at uh, minus three. Okay, so... Um, the initial surgery done before was also a, a temporal incision. Uh, I'm more comfortable doing this. And then same uh, with when I implant ICLs. So we will just enlarge that incision compared to cataract surgery to three millimeters so we can um, explant this lens. Uh, I just plan to anteriorize the temporal plate haptic side. Um, and then, um, of course, try to protect the endothelium by using viscoelastic gel uh, in front and behind. And then, of course, uh, through side port uh, manipulators, uh, we can actually uh, pop out the haptics. This lens is really big, as you can see through um, Lisa's and Bobby's video. Um, it really hugs the sulco, so it's, it's quite um, difficult to actually uh, pop one out. Uh, but uh, as you... Uh, saw during the videos, uh, the tuck and slide, um, more or less that, that those things will also come into mind when you um, explant uh, one of the haptics. So the decision here was to remove the fake kick lens uh, through the long axis as a whole. So I wasn't really um, inclined to cut it in half, although some people do that. And then, of course, I'd like to protect the endothelium. So having a, an instrument like a spatula on the side or uh, as you pull the uh, IOL out just to protect the endothelium, especially those near the main incision. So um, have you, you, you've seen the video of Bobby loading it. So this is the place where you're supposed to hold on uh, with a forcep because this is, um, you know, the, the, the toughest portion of the lens. I try not to hold it at the tips of the haptic because some, I've seen some lenses uh, there with that. Okay, so Siguro, we can, um, I'll stop the share and um, we can play the video, um, which is in Mam John's um, computer. And I'll just annotate. 
Right. So the video we're sharing here is the left eye. Uh, okay, so we've dilated it already and we're now putting a, a, a dispersive viscoelastic. And then um, we're also using um, a cohesive now. So there's viscoelastic in front and behind the lens. So here I was trying to see if I can pop out one of the uh, haptics uh, with a viscoelastic. So it's not because uh, the lens is quite big. So we proceeded to make the temporal incision. As you can see, the eye is really long, so it's quite soft. So it's a 2.75 knife, which we just um, enlarged a little bit sidewards. Okay, and then now, um, okay, so I decentered the, the side part and I'm trying to use a simple intraocular lens manipulator to go underneath the plate tap and then pull it out. I don't want to traumatize the, the endothelium, so I, I use a spatula on the other end to just simply slide it uh, centrally and then pop out the haptic, which uh, was done. Naman. And then we just um, added a little viscoelastic. Some of it has um, come out when we were doing the initial manipulation. There, so more viscoelastic underneath the IOL, especially near where the temporal plate is. So same maneuver again, uh, using two instruments, one to make sure uh, you protect the, the, the lens from hitting the endothelium and the other one for popping up. The, so you try to slide it centrally and then you just pop it out. And then, uh, well, the forcep I used is actually, um, a three-piece foldable um, um, inserting forcep we used to use before. And so it's cross-action, so you can insert a little more um, squeeze. All right. So I just slid um, one of the jaws above and below and then held the lens where it's at stuff best. And then I now, uh, before I pulled it out, I made sure... Um, my spatula was just there pushing on the optic so it doesn't um, traumatize or bump uh, the endothelial surface, especially in the, near the area of the wound. Uh, after which I um, now remove the cohesive viscoelastic. Okay, um, I'm trying to just remove the viscoelastic that's actually that clung on to the anterior uh, lens capsule, you can see that subcapsular um, opacification there um, superiorly. So we now, now inject a tripan blue. So I'm trying to paint uh, the anterior capsule yeah, because some of the gel is still stuck probably to the endothelial surface. And then we wash it out. And then we proceed to put um, uh, a new bolus of viscoelastic, this time to really deep in the chamber to prepare it for um, uh, for the cataract surgery. Uh, luckily, we had uh, a digital markerless system on hand, so uh, it was nice so you can actually um, just trace removal of the um, capsule. We were quite um, careful to remove, uh, to do the capsular rexis at the area of the subcapsular uh, plaque. Uh, it wasn't that adherent anyway. Uh, but sometimes, probably uh, with a longer period of time that ICL is there, you might encounter one. So just be careful. Um, my mindset, if I don't have a digital marker system, is um, mainly to, because these eyeballs are long and the pupils are quite dilated. So actually just try to make a capsular axis that's smaller than the usual. And in the end, you'll basically make, um, end up making a just right capsular axis. Uh, usually the pitfall in long eyeballs is you tend to make a very, very big capsular axis that will actually be bigger than the optic material you're using for your foldable lens. So um, you've seen we've, we've already done uh, higher dissection. So initially putting in the, I know you, you saw the retropulsion, but it didn't really amount to much. Okay, so we'll just um, maybe jump uh, from the first, um, from the first break uh, all the way to the removal of the nucleus, all right? So here we've removed the nucleus. It wasn't really that that big, although it was uh, slightly dense. 
All right. So I, I wasn't able to um, rotate the epinucleus. So uh, since this, uh, this is a young patient, we just decided to just use the irrigation and aspiration um, device to, to um, finish the, the job. So, so here I'm, uh, uh, usually I'm using my default um, INA handpiece, which is um, a silicon tip one. Um, so once we we finish that, so um, well, it's not seen here, but the the capsular axis seems to be just right. It, it kind of looked oval after. Uh, but now we're going to inject a a single piece plate piece plated toric intraocular le monofocal lens. All right. So once the the lens is now um, pushed into the capsular bag, uh, since this patient have a, has a significant um, with the rule astigmatism, so we're now rotating the the lens to more or less the intended axis. So uh, before I do a final rotation, I would uh, make sure I um, I hydrate the wounds to make sure that the wound is sealed so the chamber will not shallow once I. Uh, I remove the viscoelastic material at the end of the surgery. Okay, so for toric lenses, again, uh, make sure you aspirate uh, viscoelastic material behind the lens. Okay, so once uh, we're going to do, so we just turned on the, the marking system so we can do a final alignment. Okay, and then once uh, that was done, we just um, pressed on the wound. Of course, we've hydrated it previously, and uh, more or less that's uh, that's that. So we we try to leave the eyes slightly softer than the usual uh, after we inject the antibiotic inside, uh, because this is a toric lens. Um, yep, that's it, and uh, probably. We can go back to the slides again. Thank you, Mom Joan. So, um, well, going back, um, well, um, of course, we did the, the procedure sequentially, and uh, luckily we had a very nice result. So, the patient actually on the right eye was seeing. Um, with the refraction that we're getting around 2020 minus in 2025, the patient actually prefers no distance spectacles and it just uses uh, reading ads. And um, three weeks to one month after the second eye was done, we actually asked the patient to return to his retina specialist just to make sure that um, his retina was checked and then there were, there were no issues uh, uh, bring, brought about uh, post op. Uh, I think that's it. Um, well, thank you. Thank you for, uh, for your attention and thank you for having me.